Yep, it is. So four years ago, I gave a presentation at the University of Waterloo about what is blockchain. And after the presentation, a student came up to me and asked, that was very interesting, but why is it relevant to me? At the time, I couldn't give a, a very good answer. Uh, but with what I know today, I would go back and tell the same student that you shouldn't care. That's not to say blockchain won't impact his life, uh, quite the contrary. But it is folks like yourselves, the technologists, the fintech entrepreneurs, who should really embrace and understand this technology because it is a disruptive tool that will impact the next billion users. So loosely based around the innovator's dilemma's definition of a disruptive technology, blockchain is disruptive because it is able to achieve 10x in terms of efficiency compared to status quo. It is starting in a niche market, market that the incumbents do not care about. Uh, and it's steadily moving up market into the market shares of the incumbents. Who here has bought a share or a stock from a, a bank or financial institution before? All right, so the majority of us. For those who have not, let me tell you how painful the process is today. If I don't have an account, I need to go to my FI, my financial institution, to uh, open an account, submit a flurry of personal information uh, to them. It'll take them a business day or two to process that information to make sure that I'm not a terrorist, I'm who I am, uh, and generally this is process is called Know Your Customer, or KYC. And then I need to move my money from my bank account into my trading account. This takes on average three business days in Canada. And then finally, when I have my account set up, I have money inside my account, I can uh, put up my first trade, my first order. And my, when my order is matched, clearing and settlement today in Canada takes three business days. So that means if I want to buy an RBC stock today because it is great value, I won't have money or my account open until this Thursday, and I won't have the share settled into my account until next Tuesday. And this complex diagram on my left and right is the current clearing and settlement process today. Blockchain achieves 18,000 times in efficiency. It is able to bring down the clearing and settlement time from three days to 14 seconds. And instead of me telling you how exactly that process works, I want us all to experience that together. So if you open up your Uport app, Uport is a decentralized, a self-sovereign identity system. And what that means is, it's similar to your Google or Facebook identity, it is your digital identity. But the only difference is that you own your data. So for example, after I created my identity, uh, I can put attestations against my identity. So for example, my name is Henry, and my SIM card number is 123456789. I can take, then take this uh, attestation and go to the Ministry of Transportation and have an authority sign off saying, yes, they have verified this claim and that is the correct uh, SIM card number for Henry. So what this allows for is I can then take this identity, go to RBC, and have my KYC procedure done. So it'll still take one day, one or two business days. But then I can take this already KYC identity and go to different FIs, and this is a do it once and reuse many times model. So that increases the efficiency. Uh, now we're going to simulate purchasing a share with using your, your Uport application. Oops. Uh, so if you open up Uport, click on the three dots to the top right, and then click on Advanced, click on Try Uport, and then click on Interactive Demo. So if you did it correctly and if the Wi-Fi is working, this would bring up a, uh, a mock online brokerage that I, using my already KYC identity, I want to go there and buy some shares. So if you click on connect with Uport, that will pop up and it will open up Uport. And on this screen, you'll notice uh, some information is populated. The online brokerage is requesting some information about myself before they allow me to go on their platform to purchase these shares. So if you click continue, 
You'll then notice your name and your picture should pop up in the top right, meaning that you've logged in. And then now I'm going to input, I want to buy five shares in this new company. And then hit buy shares. So I'll ask to open up Uport again. And now you see a confirmation screen. So this is to make sure that you are you, you recognize what you're buying, and this is also the screen where you are paying for your shares that you're buying. Uh, since this is a mock application, we're not paying any Ether to purchase these shares. If you hit approve, it'll ask for your touch ID or your PIN. And now the transaction is pushed to the Ethereum testnet for the miners to process this transaction. And in about 14 seconds, this transaction would be matched, cleared, and settled without any intermediary. And in under two minutes that we went through this demo, we're able to purchase a share and have it settled into your account where you have the sole custody of these shares. No one else can access these. So the second attribute about a disruptive technology is it always starts in a niche market. So uh, the, the interesting thing about blockchain is its roots and its, uh, its relationship with cryptocurrency. This slide is already out to date. I've made this last week. Uh, the cryptocurrency market today is about $300 billion. Um, but it is three folds three orders of magnitude smaller than the global stock, debt, or derivatives market, which are in the trillions. Um, but we're already seeing a lot of innovation happening in this niche market. We're seeing more efficient exchanges. We're seeing decentralized exchanges that are disrupting these more efficient exchanges. We're seeing wallet providers, we're seeing portfolio providers, and we're seeing one-click accounting solutions. So what's going to happen from here? We're, we're going to start to see uh, blockchain to start moving up market into the stock, into the debt, into the derivatives market. Over this past summer, I was involved with a project called Braid the Movie, where they sold a crypto equity token on the Ethereum mainnet. Uh, and any individual globally could have participated in the sale and, you, the, and, and went through the experience that you just went through right now. So in under two minutes, they were able to purchase a share in this company. The three biggest barriers that I see preventing blockchain from being adopted faster are threefold. First is, is regulation. So our, our regulators need to really understand the technology how, and how it reconciles with today's laws and, and, and regulations. The second is technology, where uh, currently the Ethereum mainnet processes seven transactions per second, which is... Uh, in a very tiny amount compared to Visa or MasterCard processing over 100,000 transactions per second. And lastly, it's the user experience. What would happen if your end user loses their private key? And that's where you as technologists, as fintech entrepreneurs really come into the picture. To create applications that have a seamless user experience such that as an end user, I don't care or I don't even know that I'm buying a share on blockchain. All I know is that I'm purchasing a share that's faster, more secure, with a better user experience. And blockchain fundamentally removes friction from ecosystems. So if I leave you with the last idea is you utilize blockchain as a disruptive tool to remove friction from the world. Thank you. Any questions? Thanks. So I guess the focus here has been very finance focused, the low hanging fruit for blockchain uh, financial services. What kind of stuff is consensus working on kind of more on the social level? I mean, it, blockchain changes the way humans interact with one another. It's kind of a fundamental shift in, in the way that we, we interact. So what kind of stuff is consensus working on? Uh, that, that excites you? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have a part of our organization that's called the Blockchain for Social Impact Coalition. It's a consortium of 
companies uh, and organizations that are coming together to uh, apply blockchain to social causes. So an example of the Uport application that you just saw uh, could be applied to refugees or to uh, people in the third world country or developing country that do not have an identity or where they could lose their identity uh, because of war. And having this digital identity, you're able to move from country to country while retaining your identity. Uh, and, and the perks of this is if you own a piece of land, for example, in, in your home country, um, and, and you were forced to move away, and those records were destroyed, one of the promises of blockchain is being able to tokenize that piece of land and, and have it associated with your, your public and private key such that you can always have a claim to that plot of land. It looks like you're against the entire infrastructure of financial intermediation. And uh, what, <laughs> what are your thoughts or uh, how are you going to work with, with these, the, the current existing financial intermediation structures, custodians such as brokers, all other institutions? Yeah, that's a great question. So in, I think we can all agree that the current financial ecosystem and the value chain is very complicated and there are probably several intermediaries that are unnecessary because of the inefficiencies. But in the end state in the blockchain world, you would still have custodians because you might not want the risk to be holding on to your, your private keys. So you still want someone else to hold on to it. You will probably still want uh, investment advisors where you don't want to you don't really know where to deploy your capital. So th th there are some roles that will still be retained, but the, the roles that the financial institutions uh, that could be automated will be automated. Hi, so I have a question around um, just regulation. Uh, so with, this is a new technology and there isn't a lot of regulation around it. Just wanted to know your thoughts around um, should there really be any regulation around it or what kind of regulation would actually make sense? Yeah, that's a good question. So we're seeing a lot of government entities across uh, uh, in the world that are really being pro proactive towards uh, making sure that there, there's a good sandbox in, uh, environment for people to experiment in. So a good example is the government of Singapore where they created a, a sandbox for people to uh, do ICOs, and same with the Ontario government, they actually have been pretty proactive. Um, and to the point that the, the RBC gentleman made earlier, the Singapore government uh, is actually one of the most innovative governments right now. They're asking uh, all the banks to come together to create a, a blockchain solution to really understand uh, how to regulate it by doing it themselves. Another question. Uh, why have you chosen to use Ethereum as the main currency in your application, and have you considered others? Uh, and w at w what use does it have in, in the Uport ID application? What was the second part? What use does it have? What do you mean by what use does it have? Does Ethereum have in... Uh, oh, got it. Okay, so there are a handful of... Uh, <laughs> No, sorry, not a handful. There are over hundreds and hundreds of cryptocurrencies out there, uh, but there are three main ones today, uh, four. There's Bitcoin, there's Ethereum, there's Hyperledger, and there's the R3 Corda. Uh, in terms of building applications, you can't build anything on the Bitcoin platform, so you're left with the, the, the latter three. Um, Ethereum, out of, out of the latter three, Ethereum is the only one that has a public network. So if you were to build anything that will interact with the public, you would be painting yourself into a corner if you were to use Hyperledger or to use Corda. Um, and the difference between Ethereum and, and, and Bitcoin is Ethereum allows you to write smart contracts, which are basically applications that you can deploy uh, on the Ethereum network, such as the, the Uport app that you just saw. All right, last question. Thanks. So you talked about the efficiency in you know trading stocks, for example, right? But how does that really affect the user? Because for example, right now with the T plus three settlement cycle, 
the actual user doesn't really af you know, affect that. Like they don't feel it because the risk is taken on by the brokerages. And now with uh, you know, the, some of these fintechs coming up, I forgot the name of the one, but it's based in the US where they don't charge any commission to trade anymore. Um, what big advantages does your platform really offer? Um, so you're asking why is T plus three better than T zero? Right, okay, got it. So the end user ultimately pays the price. And I, I say that because, uh, yes, even though the brokerages take on the risk, but they are, they are charging the end consumer for that risk that they're paying. So if you were to reduce T plus three to T zero, uh, the, the financial institutions are able to lower their counterparty risk and lower a ton of their risk and decrease their working capital even. So that would end up in cost savings that the end user will ultimately see. All right, thanks Henry.